I would like to introduce myself. My name is uh, Yves Joannet. I'm uh, at the Université de Montréal, a professor at the Faculty of Medicine and also at the Centre de Recherche of the Institut Universitaire de Gériatrie de Montréal. But I'm here today because I'm the chair of the uh, management committee of the Justine and Yves Sergent uh, Fund, and uh, which is in charge of the annual uh, award of the, uh, of the fund. Um, I would like to just uh, speak uh, uh, a little bit about uh, the uh, fund itself, uh, just to position and to have everyone knows. Uh, the fund has been endowed at the University of Montréal in 1998 by the family of uh, Yves Sergent, uh, which was also the adopted family of Justine Sergent and Mrs. Edith Loubier. And I would like just to recognize their um, really uh, their uh, devotion to this uh, fund that Henriette Sergent was the one who insisted in creating this fund that it should be awarding a, um, a, a top-notch uh, cognitive neuroscientist uh, in the field but should be a woman uh, and so that's Henriette Sergent who insisted and Mrs. Edith Lobier who also um, provided the support of the Edith and John Lobier Foundation uh, as well to create the fund who was uh, a, a, a very active in many different areas in Montreal, um, including um, uh, music and arts and environments, but also in, 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 with the university. And for that, she uh, received the Honoris Causa Doctorate from the University of Montreal, and she's an honorary member of the Faculty of Medicine here in Montreal. And the, the fund, as uh, um, those of you might not know, was uh, created to the memory of both Justine and Yves Sergent, who both passed away on April 12th of 1994, uh, in, in a complicated context of a long-standing, uh, profound misunderstanding, uh, including allegation of uh, misconduct, for which, in fact, an inquiry was uh, suspended three years after uh, her, their death uh, without uh, um, any evidence being uh, raised. And this is why, uh, because of the uh, unique contribution of uh, Justine Sergent to the field, this fund was there to create, uh, to, to recognize excellence. And uh, Justine Sergent, for those who um, might not know, was born in Lebanon. She was a uh, um, primary school teacher. Uh, and uh, there she met uh, someone named Yves Sergent. Uh, and they uh, rapidly uh, went to, to uh, France, uh, uh, around Paris, announced that they would be get be, they would uh, wed, and uh, and uh, just after Yves Sergent had a job in Montreal, and uh, Justine Sergent came uh, as well in Montreal. Uh, she was first uh, a primary school teacher in some schools in Montreal, and then she enrolled in uh, psychology. And she, she did a, um, a really very rapid career uh, um, as a scientist and as a very influential person in the field. And uh, both Yves Sergent and Justine Sergent uh, being music lovers uh, were certainly, um, well, they, they joined this interest with their interest on the brain. And uh, Justine was among the first person to uh, publish important papers on the uh, brain, connect, brain function of brain activation in, in music, for instance, but also about face perception. And this relates to the, to the uh, uh, conference uh, today, in fact. Um, and, but, but this last picture uh, just uh, illustrates how they were very close together and uh, because they had, uh, very little family, no family in Montreal, and academia was their really their only thing. Um, the decision they took at one point was uh, together. Uh, I just want to bring your attention to the fact that uh, Justine Sergent contributed to many important uh, articles. Um, we see here a number in uh, brain, but also this uh, paper in science, um, which was uh, again, very uh, important um, using PET. Um, but, at the, but at the end, because of, of the fact that the, uh, the, the, their perception of what they were living in their uh, milieu uh, was very uh, difficult, um, they wrote this note on, in April, 1994, 
and then uh, passed away. And I think uh, if, if there's something to, to be kept in mind here is really the importance that um, uh, the academic uh, milieu and wellness, the academic wellness of, uh, of, of us uh, researchers um, should be uh, attended to because that's uh, certainly a very important uh, thing. So um, the Justin and Yves Sergent Fund has a management committee. Uh, the former Dean of uh, Medicine, Patrick Vinet is a member and he was also a friend of uh, Justin Sergent. Uh, Dr. Pierre Rainville is uh, the current uh, acting director at the uh, research center and myself are the uh, management committee. The scientific committee who is uh, choosing um, through a uh, proactive search of the, the environment, so there's no uh, call for that price, is made up of uh, Dr. Daniel Bob, uh, a former uh, researcher who was uh, in Montreal, Dr. Rita Hari, uh, who uh, also received the price, and, and we were absolutely shocked last week to uh, hear, hear that Dr. Leslie Ungerleiter, who was on, who, was on the scientific committee just passed away uh, six days ago and I just want to uh, recognize uh, this uh, maybe I'll ask uh, for a 10 second of silence in memory of, of uh, Leslie Ungerleiter who was both a superb scientist but also a fabulous mentor uh, and a fabulous colleague and as well the first recipient of the Justine and Yves Sergent Award in 1999 when the, the, the award was, was created. So I'll, I'll ask just for 10, uh, 15 seconds of uh, silence here. And to all, her, her friends and colleagues uh, are, are pensées for all of you because we know she was really appreciated. Last year, uh, we had in person in Montreal the, uh, the, the, the event that we're having today and Angela Friderici was the uh, recipient. Another person on the, who is attending, Cathy uh, uh, Price also had the, the award, was well, offered the award some years ago. But this year, we're absolutely thrilled with uh, the awardee, who uh, uh, is uh, Dr. Maria Luisa or Marilou Gorno Tempini. Um, we all know that uh, Marilou is a PhD in imaging and cognitive neuroscience uh, from, from London. Uh, she is currently professor in residence in neurology and also has an appointment in psychiatry at University of California, San Francisco. She ha had a, a, a very uh, interesting career being also trained as a uh, MD in medicine and surgery um, with the cum laude uh, diploma from uh, Brescia in, in Italy. She had a number of uh, fellowship she has been recognized at the Distinguished Clinician Scientist Award at the University of Brescia. She did uh, uh, was received the Charles Schwab Distinguished Professorship from the University of California. She has numerous publications, a impressive H index, cited many, many times. And we, we know that there's the Gorno Tempini, we're all aware, uh, hypothesis in some, in some of, of, of the area. But she also contributed very significantly to uh, mentorship. And in that sense, uh, I will just ask for a two minute comment by someone who benefited from this uh, mentorship. Uh, Dr. Simona Brambati, you might say some work here. Thank you, Yves. It is for me a great pleasure to be here today. I just want to spend a couple of words on Marilu. Everybody knows that she's a great researcher a pioneer in our field, I just want to add a couple of words on Marilou as a mentor and supervisor. Student supervision is one of our priorities. She is extremely generous with her resources, knowledge, and expertise. Over the last 15 years, she has supervised over 100 fellows, research associates, and students at different stages of their career, 
and of different scientific and cultural backgrounds. As they grew into successful clinicians and researchers, she has shaped a new generation of experts in the field of neurobiology of language. And only great leaders can accomplish this result. As a first postdoc, I can testify how inspiring she is as supervisor. She is a great teacher, but she is more than that. She is a role model. Through her passion, hard work, curiosity, and care for others, she pushes people around her to be better. She always reminds that settling for mediocrity is not a safe option. It is not an option at all. Personally, I feel that thanks to Marilou, I'm not a better researcher, but I'm also a better person. And I'm sure that these words reflect the feeling of the many people who have worked with her during these years. Thank you, Marilou, and thanks, Yves, for, gi for giving me the opportunity to talk today. I now leave the floor to Dr. Gornot and Pini's presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Simona. And I, I think uh, uh, this really testifies for, for uh, an, a very important uh, aspect of uh, all your uh, contribution and realization. So now uh, I will ask uh, uh, officially uh, Dr. Maria Luisa Gorno Tempini to provide the annual uh, Justine and Yves Sergent Award uh, lecture. So thanks, uh, uh, Marilou, for having accepted to give the, the award. And after the award, we'll have a 10 minute uh, small ceremony for, to present you with the, uh, with, with the award itself. It's up to you for about uh, 40 minutes, Marilou. I'm going to uh, stop sharing and you can now share. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eve. Um, thank you, um, Simona. You made me almost cry now, so I need to take a breath. And <laughs> um, you didn't tell me this, Eve. I wasn't. I wasn't prepared. <laughs> um, it's such an honor to be uh, recognized uh, with this award. Um, I want to thank the scientific committee and um, Mrs. Juliette Sargent for being so, so, have such a foresight in back in 1999 to institute a prize for only for women cognitive neuroscientists. It is an honor to receive the prize together with a, a list of uh, uh, amazingly accomplished and smart women uh, that have already been given the prize comprising um, my first, uh, well, let's say, first uh, full-time research mentor, um, Kathy Price. And uh, um, what I'm gonna do today is talk about a line of, one of the line of uh, research that um, we have developed through the year and that was really inspired um, by Justine Sargent's work. Um, it was very emotional for me to receive Eve's call and think back about my early days in Brescia, in Milan, in London, reading um, John Steen's paper on faces and objects as I was trying to decide and going a little bit neurotically from the basic science lab and the clinic and deciding whether I wanted to be a clinician or a basic scientist and really reading her papers together with Oliver Sacks' um, books made, um, uh, had a huge part on, on uh, my curiosity about uh, uh, semantics and face perceptions and object perceptions and, and really shaped my, my career for the decades to come. So it is really an honor to, to the receive this prize and the talk today is gonna um, take us through a little bit of how these findings and pioneering findings from um, Justine um, inspired um, and um, how her legacy continues through today. I'm gonna also try to celebrate women um, uh, scientists, cognitive neuroscientists and neurologists, so apologies to my male mentors, but uh, today I'm gonna try to, to concentrate more on, um, on uh, uh, women who've had a lot of influence on me, mentors and students alike. So uh, as, as Eves has shown there, uh, Justine was really a pioneer of the early studies of 
um, one of the fields on face and object perceptions. And what really inspired me in reading many of her papers, and there is one example here, is how she really combined a detailed um, uh, case uh, descriptions and neuropsychological descriptions with the first studies of functional imaging in healthy subjects and how she went back and forth between um, uh, patients and results in uh, functional imaging in, in healthy subjects. And this is an example of one of the, it was basically a review of all her work on, uh, on face and object perception and prosopagnosia, which is always um, really uh, interests me. And we could already see some of the findings that will then be confirmed uh, later on about the involvement of the ventral um, cortex in face processing. But also she observed very early on one of the first cases in, the, in which there was a lesion of the anterior, right anterior temporal lobe. And already on this paper, she really hypothesized finding that findings that we've only confirmed in the last few years. So in the same paper, she presents one of the first studies using PET with oxygen 15 on uh, face perceptions and famous face perception and really identified these two areas, the fusiform gyrus and the anterior temporal lobes as the most important um, areas for the perception of known people. And she asked these questions and left these questions open, um, unfortunately didn't have the time to pursue them, that really shaped um, mine and the careers of hundreds of other scientists. So um, where does face and object specificity comes from? Why does this area in the right fusiform gyrus activates much more uh, for faces than for objects? And what is the effects of um, tasks that individuals do in, in the functional imaging scans on these activations? And what are the roles of the right and left anterior temporal lobe that she's now activated in, in these PET studies for recognizing famous people versus objects? So there I was as a medical student in Brescia and in, uh, in Milan, and uh, starting about the same time to be a research assistant with uh, Daniela Perani at the uh, San Raffaele Hospital, and starting to, to look at these same questions in, in, uh, in the semantics of objects and man-made tools. And thank you, Daniela, for your support in that um, early time. At the same time, in the behavioral neurology world, uh, the, this, we, there were seminal papers describing patients with neurodegenerative, focal neurodegenerative diseases that present as language um, disturbances. So there was a description of semantic dementia from the Cambridge group and the description of primary progressive aphasia uh, in the United States by uh, Marcel Mazalam. And the distinction between the two for a few years was not quite clear. Uh, it was clear from pioneering work from Kath Mamory and Kathy Price that there was applying for the first time voxel-based morphometry to patients, that the atrophy in these patients was anterior in the anterior temporal lobe and not in the perisylvian cortex as it was hypothesized instead. It was seen in primary progressive aphasia. So it was not quite clear how the two syndromes overlapped. So after finishing my, um, my uh, medical school and uh, uh, residency training, I moved to London where I had the fortune of working um, with Dr. Kathy Price. So thank you, Kathy, for being here today. And if my mentees over the years um, uh, have to write 15, 20 drafts of their paper, you owe that to Kathy <laughs> who spent numerous hours in the tube and at home uh, reading my first papers and really shaping how I think and um, write about science. So thank you, Kathy, and such an honor to receive this prize that you have also received. So these were the first experiments that we did with Kathy, looking at famous people and famous buildings to try to get at that question that Justine had posed of why faces? Is it just, is it because uh, there are many examples of uh, faces that we need to recognize, maybe similar to building. It's not the same to recognize a famous person as it is to recognize a chair or a table because we expose the humans are such experts in, uh, in a face perception. And so we thought we would look at early on and using still PET with oxygen 15 activation studies at famous faces, famous buildings and famous proper names. And look at the um, uh, activation and try to see whether 
uh, it was specific for faces or for this specific type of stimuli that we called unique items. So as Justine had shown, we saw that the right fusiform gyrus was activated actually just for faces and not for buildings. So it was not from the perceptual point of view, it was not really because of the uniqueness and of the items, but it seemed to be something specific to faces. And um, the same for buildings at the perceptual level. So no difference between famous and non-famous stimuli seem to be more medial in the parapocampal gyrus, maybe through this medial route network uh, useful for navigation. When we look at famous um, faces and famous buildings and famous proper names, these areas in the anterior temporal lobes uh, started to, to show. Um, and specifically in the bilateral temporal lobes, and more on the left side for, for names. So we started to um, think that the activation actually in the anterior temporal lobes had to do with the un semantic uniqueness of the items. The fact that to, we need a lot of converging information to um, retrieve biographical and lexical uh, information about um, famous people and famous um, buildings. So why wasn't the anterior temporal lobe described and, and let's say included in the main hubs for language processing? This is because traditionally before the, the start of the uh, systematic study of the semantic dementia, um, aphasiology had mainly concentrated on stroke patients and the anterior temporal lobe is not commonly hit by stroke. So we, the field and myself in particular started getting more interested in, in the neural basis of semantic memory in particular, and um, wanted to really study how um, the semantic information is organized in comparison with um, episodic um, information. And so uh, I started and the, the looking at uh, the patients with the semantic dementia and PPA and really realized this issue and actually also realized that with their equipment who was sitting next to me at the, at the, uh, at the fill that although some patients with PPA had perisylvian atrophy, many of them also had anterior temporal atrophy. So it wasn't quite clear still how the two syndromes were um, related to each other. And so I moved to San Francisco and um, to work in the group that at that point was 10 people with uh, Bruce Miller. Thank you, Bruce, for being here. I'm sorry you can't win the Justine Sarjan um, award, but you've won basically every other award on earth. And uh, uh, so thank you for um, all your support in the past 20 years. It's been an amazing adventure. This was the campus at UCSF, is the campus at Parnassus where we started in this little office on the fifth floor where I shared an office with uh, Simona and now at the beautiful Mission Bay um, uh, campus. So primary progressive aphasia. Um, when I moved to San Francisco, this was the task that um, um, Bruce gave me was to work on the, on the syndrome because most of the MAC was really interested in behavior. And the primary progressive aphasia was really described as a, as a syndrome with uh, word finding, naming, and word comprehension um, difficulties, progressive and isolated. And uh, with neuroanatomy, as we said, with the perisylvian atrophy and a description of pathology that back then was thought to be typically non-Alzheimer's. And some of the description overlapped with semantic dementia, but not completely. So what, what uh, we did at the MAC with Simona and all the other colleagues, it, uh, take all the knowledge in cognitive neuroscience that I had learned in London and try to construct um, uh, um, evaluation of these patients that consider all the different aspects of uh, uh, recognizing an item, naming it, pronouncing the name, and thinking about all the stages of processing that Justine had described when she was looking at her prosopagnosic patients. And by doing that, we identified three variants of a primary progressive aphasia in which uh, semantic uh, dementia or semantic variant was um, the, the variant that involved the anterior temporal lobes really bilaterally, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
it took six years to um, uh, publish uh, classification criteria for these uh, three variants. I'm very grateful to R.G. Hillis, who's also an awardee of the, the Justine uh, Sargent um, uh, Fund, who was very supportive when I moved to the United States, uh, invited me to speak, give, uh, invited me to direct her course at the AAN conferences, supported my grants and papers, so very thankful to, to RG for her um, support as a newcomer in the US uh, world of, uh, of behavioral neurology. Very important, we think, to divide the PPAs in the three main variants, not just from a syndromic clinical point of view, but also uh, for predicting um, the cause, the molecular cause of the neurodegenerative disease. So logopenic uh, PPAs mainly caused by Alzheimer's disease, non-fluent agrammatic PPAs mainly caused by a tauopathy, and semantic variant PPA or semantic dementia is mainly caused by um, TDP pathology. So let's talk a little bit more about the studies on semantic variant because again, um, we pursued, we continue to pursue with the, um, the whole group, this study of face and people perceptions and understanding through the years. Um, so how does it manifest? Confrontation naming and single word comprehension deficits, object people and sound identification uh, deficits and reading and writing deficits and uh, reading exception words and surface dyslexia. As we said, is characterized by left or right anterior temporal atrophy and neuropathology, um, FTLD, TDP pathology. We have the incredible honor at UCSF to follow patients for years all the way to pathology and uh, have the opportunity to, to study not only imaging correlates, but also um, pathological and molecular cor uh, correlates. So very grateful to the faith that our patients um, put on us for all these years. So here's an example for some of you who have not, might have not seen a semantic patient. This is a naming uh, task. Is that a vegetable, uh, a fruit, fruit, dog? I don't know what that is. Typical examples of semantic errors. Can you can you hear the sound? Semantic errors in a semantic patients who produces superordinate categories or uh, doesn't recognize the items or might make prototypicality errors, so calling um, um, the cow or dog. An example of the object recognition and identification problems. Cup. Cup. That's right. Okay. How about the matches? Matches. This one? Which one is the matches? I don't know what the matches are. This is mind. a typical example of fluent grammatical speech, but um, uh, really lack of knowledge of the word and the object. So functional imaging studies in healthy subjects of words and objects had described different neural bases for uh, different categories. And so on the, uh, our patients with neurodegenerative diseases, we wanted to see if we could um, uh, replicate this, these findings and actually see um, trying to get the, to the question that Kathy had so well posed about necessary and sufficient um, uh, neural basis for different tasks. So we had this uh, data on the 64 random naming task in uh, uh, many uh, patients with uh, PPA and other neurodegenerative disease, more than 100, 150, I think. And uh, Simona did our first VBM correlation study has her uh, one, while we were sharing the office at Parnassus and really showed that um, living items correlated with volume of the right anterior temporal lobe and non-living items with uh, 
uh, uh, damage of the left uh, temporal parietal cortex. So here's uh, Simona as a happy associate professor in Montreal, but here she was back in San Francisco as my first postdoc, uh, working at home with my little daughter. So thank you, Simona, for being patient with me as a first uh, uh, postdoc. It was, uh, it, it was really fun to work together and to keep working together even now. So what about famous faces? You know, I was still curious about my famous faces inspired by um, Justine and really saw that patients with semantic variant, even with the left variant as this patient had uh, severe deficits in recognizing and knowing and naming uh, famous faces. Does it look familiar at all? A little bit, but I don't remember. This guy here? Yeah. Obviously, I should be remembering these people, but I don't know these ones. Yeah. What if I say Harry Truman? Is that, is that who he is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't remember Harry Truman. This guy here, do you know who he is? So this was the first observation that was really striking is that this was not just a prosopagnosia. So this highly um, functioning and educated man really did not know even the name of Harry Truman. He did not just lose perception of the faces. Actually, his perception of faces was perfect, but he had lost knowledge about, uh, about the person. And then, um, so thinking back about Justine's paper, um, really this bilateral activation of the anterior temporal lobes that was not observed that much in the following studies with fMRI, and really because fMRI uh, has big dropout in the anterior temporal lobe. So the, the, these regions in the functional imaging literature kind of um, went under the radar a little bit, but these studies in, uh, in the semantic dementia patients were really fundamental to highlight the, the role of these regions. And so we started um, thinking about the, the model based on the Bruce and Young model and um, uh, realizing that maybe we had the structural encoding uh, part of the network for identifying um, known people. And we had also identified the lexical, the, the semantic and maybe lexical components of the system, but we were really missing what he um, in the model was called face recognition unit, which is really where we start recognizing a face as familiar, but we still cannot retrieve the verbal semantic information related to them. So it's happened to all of us. Oh, I know this person. I've seen it before. I should know who it is, but I don't really, um, I cannot really remember. And we noticed in the patients, actually with Simone, I think when you were there, that, um, and I'll kind of skip to the second here, stimulus here, that patients with the- mm -hmm. You know who she is? She's the one. Yeah, I don't remember names. Mm -hmm. But do you know who she is even if not her name? Is she an actress or a politician? Or So what he did, he recognized the face. The task did not involve retrieving names or semantic information. So we noticed that in a task like this, in which they only had to point to the face that looked familiar without retrieving any information, uh, they could actually do it in a forced choice. Um, they could do it, uh, especially patients with left-sided atrophy. And these were the patients that we mainly seen. This was a a patient that we were seeing in the early 2000s, and um, they were mainly left temporal. And although they had no idea who the person is, they could pick the familiar one if given a choice within um, uh, an array of faces that were perceptually matched. So um, vaguely, let's say, perceptually matched. So you could not do the choice just based on perceptual features. So then another uh, happy postdoc at the University of Montreal now, a fabulous mentee, Valentina uh, Borghesani, who uh, 
I, we seem to have a stream between San Francisco and, uh, and uh, Montreal, which I'm happy and unhappy about. <laughs> it's really hard to see them go, um, but I don't quite let them go uh, <laughs> ever. So Valentina uh, did a similar study of what um, Simona had done, but on our task on uh, famous faces, which we had collected through the years uh, in, uh, uh, again, about 180 patients in three tasks. So one task was a naming just uh, of one single famous face. The other was a variant of the pyramid and palm trees task. So a semantic association task in which um, uh, patients had to associate uh, the top uh, face at the top with the one, uh, one at the bottom for uh, profession. And so in theory, no um, uh, uh, verbal semantic information had to be recalled. But if we look at how kind of and again, I had learned from Kathy back then how important and from doing functional imaging study, how important it was to match conditions. And, and back from Justine really, who had thought about tasks and how important it was to match, uh, not just uh, stimuli, but also the tasks that patients were doing and in individuals in the, in the functional uh, imaging uh, scan. So we had to match faces perceptually. Again, you could not make this decision just based on, on look, and we managed to find some good looking uh, politician, it really needed to retrieve information. And then that familiarity task that you saw before. And what we saw was that while the left anterior temporal lobes were uh, most involved in tasks that required retrieval of um, uh, verbal semantic information about uh, the famous faces, the right temporal lobe was instead involved in the familiarity uh, judgment. So in our model of, of uh, uh, identification of people, uh, we think we, we found the hub in this distributed network that is more involved in this maybe semantic or pre-semantic visual uh, task that um, actually Justine had described as integration of visual feature into a familiar percept, but maybe not quite yet associated with specific semantic informations. But one aspect that again, back in that paper Justine had pointed out was what about the information about emotions that we um, retrieve from a face? What about facial expressions? And is the um, uh, knowledge the emotion or knowledge that is attached to an individual or a face or a face expressions in an individual that we either know and not know, how is that organized? How does it have to do with recognizing who actually the person is? Is it the same neural network? Is it different? Is it part of a structure of a unified semantic network or does it have its own um, specific neural network that is more involved in emotions? And this really got to the core of how the semantic, semantic memories is um, organized as a whole and whether knowledge about social emotional concept is part of the um, same network and the same mechanism. And here we had the um, fortune through, through the year, um, well, not fortune for the patients who are really um, sick, unfortunately, but from a scientific point of view, um, um, uh, Bruce really had started describing these patients who had uh, right anterior temporal lobe atrophy more than left. So they were kind of in between uh, uh, semantic dimension, primary progressive aphasia and semantic primary progressive aphasia and a behavioral variant FTD. Um, they presented as sometimes with um, let's say they were described sometimes as having uh, in deficits in, in uh, recognizing faces. So as a progressive prosopagnosia and uh, some others as more aphasic. And in um, Bruce's observation, his earlier observation, actually these patients had early behavioral symptoms. So that's why they kind of fell in between. They were not really aphasic. They seemed to have face recognition problems. They also had behavioral symptoms. So they often didn't meet criteria either for PPA or BVFTD because they did have some um, aphasic symptoms. 
because symptoms, early symptoms could be behavioral, these patients usually got to us late. So the early description was where patients, like an example that you see here with extreme atrophy of the right anterior temporal lobe and already involvement of, uh, of the left. And this is because they used to go to psychiatrists for a long time. And then when aphasic symptoms uh, um, uh, occurred, they would come to neurology. So Howie Rosen at the MAC and, and um, uh, Kate Banking started it looking more um, at the uh, facial expression, neural networks of involved in facial expression recognition in these patients and did similar um, voxel-based morphometry studies on uh, um, uh, using scores on the uh, early on the uh, facial affect uh, battery and uh, and um, saw that the capacity of recognizing emotions independently of identity was correlated with, again with right anterior temporal um, atrophy. Um, Kate Ranking was really the first to show that the uh, volumes of the right anterior temporal lobe uh, correlated with empathy and empathy scores. This was on the interpersonal reactivity index, which is a questionnaire. So changes how patients change from before and after the uh, starts of disease as evaluated by their caregiver uh, really correlated with the right anterior lobe. And through the years, she defined this network that uh, functional network in healthy subjects called the semantic appraisal network that really um, uh, um, establishes it's, it's the interaction and we, you know, uh, Kate and I and Simona shared an office. So we had a lot of interesting discussions on how the value that we give, whether the value, the emotional and social value that we give uh, to objects, again, is part of the semantic network or not, and how it interacts with the social emotional um, uh, network. So um, Vale, um, took our large cohort of pathology proven um, semantic variant patients that we had at the MAC and did um, a neuroimaging based uh, uh, unsupervised analysis to really look how many of our patients with the semantic variant in our cohort had um, right greater than left atrophy. And to our surprise, actually, we realized that we had about 40%. So it's really, uh, the same disease from a molecular standpoint, and is much more frequent than, than we think. So uh, Kian Jones in the, in the lab went back and looked at all this, the uh, early symptoms in patients who had um, uh, pathology proven um, uh, temporal variant and also um, uh, right more than left atrophied and realized that the two main symptoms that occurred uh, together in most of the patients were, that were reported were actually loss of empathy and uh, later um, semantic uh, loss. And thinking about this with uh, uh, Kate Rankin and also with uh, Virginia Sturm, two amazing uh, women scientists, colleague and clinicians and the Memory and Aging Center, we and the rest of the team, we've been thinking about how to define this syndrome of the right anterior temporal more than left temporal. It's complicated. There is an interaction between um, cognition and uh, uh, behavior. And it's, we think it's really important to identify it as kind of probably the mirror of the PPAs. There is a frontal variant of PPA and a temporal variant of PPA. And we need to identify clinically the temporal variant of, in the right hemisphere, the be behavioral, let's say the temporal behavioral variant, because these patients, as we saw, often have TDP pathology. So it's important to identify them because it helps us with the pathology prediction and thus the treatment of, of these patients. And so the way that we're thinking about calling this variant, and this is a manuscript that is in, uh, in progress right now, is to use the name semantic emotional variant of FTD. Um, and the two main symptoms that we think are important for the criteria will be loss of empathy and difficulty in recognizing famous and familiar people. And the 
underlying cognitive uh, uh, mechanism behind this clinical syndrome is really a loss of nonverbal semantics. And so the right temporal lobe is, is involved in semantic features that are relevant for social and emotional information. And there we think why faces go this way because we extract so many social and emotional features from observing the other faces. And so it makes uh, 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 sense that the network, the semantic network evolved in the right hemisphere that we know is more involved in, in social and emotional stimuli and in visual features. So we think that all the work that has been done in the past 40 years, starting with uh, Justine uh, Sergent's work has helped us come all the way to defining a specific clinical syndrome that involves the right anterior temporal lobe and will help um, diagnose and uh, hopefully soon treat these patients. So I just wanna end with, um, a set acknowledgement, as Eva said, this is probably, I haven't had even the chance to read this paper because it's still in, in, in press and is not available, but this is probably um, Leslie Ungerleider's last uh, published paper in which she proposes a third visual pathway that is specialized for social perception. And these third visual pathways would go from early visual cortex into the uh, right superior temporal, um, sulcus. And uh, as she beautifully des described, this third pathway computes a range of higher social cognitive function based on dynamic uh, social cues. And so all this evidence that is being collected through the years by these amazing um, women scientists has taken us to discovering really a new uh, uh, role of a new uh, neural network. So uh, I would like again to acknowledge her work and what an honor it is for me to have been uh, awarded the same prize that she received uh, for the first time in 1999. And uh, thank you, thank you uh, to uh, Justine and Yves Sarjan for uh, uh, all their inspiring work and uh, their legacy will not be forgotten. And, and I'm sure that all of us um, women scientists will work very hard on supporting each other in the, in, uh, in the field and support new discoveries. I also wanna thank the Memory and Aging Center, the ALBA Lab, Language Neurobiology Lab. Um, it is an amazing group of people. It's been an amazing adventure starting from Brescia through London, through um, San Francisco. And I'm very grateful also to all of our patients and the funding um, sources. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Gorno Tempini. This is a, a fantastic uh, summary of your uh, uh, scientific and academic uh, tra 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 trajectory. Uh, uh, we would we would like to have a, a long time to uh, to be able to discuss uh, together. It is not the tradition of this uh, uh, event to uh, engage into a discussion, but I'm sure that people will be able to uh, contact you with some ideas, questions uh, after the uh, the talk. I would I would rather uh, suggest that um, uh, to 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 move forward with this. Uh, uh, ceremony uh, that uh, is is here today to really uh, honor you, and um, I will ask uh, the dean of the Faculty of uh, Medicine at the Université de Montréal, where the fund uh, it was uh, created, Dr. Patrick Cossette, and uh, I just want to um, underline that Dr. Patrick Cossette is uh, himself a uh, neurogeneticist uh, and in, interested in these uh, in these uh, questions, including. Uh, if I remember Dr. Cossette uh, into uh, genetics of uh, dyslexia at one point in your, uh, in your career. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Cossette to say uh, some words and then to uh, ask uh, someone who is uh, closer to you, uh, uh, both uh, in your uh, career and in your geography to help uh, offer you the, the prize. Dr. Cossette. 
Alors, bonjour à tous. Merci, Yves. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. So, uh, uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Medicine, it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, with you and um, give the prize uh, Justine and Yves Sergent, 2020, uh, to Professor Maria Luisa Gorno Tampini from uh, UCSF. Uh, C'est un prix qui est très important pour la faculté, qui a été introduit en 1999 et qui souligne l'excellence de la carrière d'une femme en neurosciences cognitives, une vision que je rappelle uh, très novatrice à l'époque. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Gorno Tampini, I haven't had the chance to uh, assist to all your presentation. I've just seen the, the last few slides, um, uh, but I was able to appreciate uh, uh, the excellent quality of the presentation. So, so congratulations and, uh, for this uh, talk. And um, it's a pleasure for me to give uh, this prize as a dean, but also as the previous director of the Department of Neuroscience at uh, U of M. Uh, it's also a pleasure for me to say that the faculty has done quite well uh, the homeworks in terms of uh, um, uh, recruitment of women in, in the faculty uh, over the years. Uh, we have um, a great uh, women with great talents and brilliant careers, not only in the Department of Neuroscience, but also um, at the level of the faculty. So um, I would like again to congratulate uh, uh, Professor Gorno Tempini for the prize. Uh, un grand merci et, et bravo aux organisateurs également de cet événement qui poursuit la tradition de ce prix. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Bruce Miller, uh, director of the UCSF uh, Dementia Center, uh, who will assist me to uh, give the prize uh, uh, to Professor uh, Tempini. Um, uh, thank you, Dean um, Cassette. Thank you, Yves Jeanat, and thank you, the University of Montreal. Uh, I, I feel there is no place uh, in the world that uh, we at UCSF are, are more, more closely aligned than with the University of Montreal, in particular, thanks to these wonderful women investigators, Simona Brambati and Valentina Borghese. Uh, I, I want to say a, a few words about uh, Mari Lou, uh, the scope of her work, and I will be short, uh, although I could take an hour, uh, and the scope of her spirit. Um, uh, the, the work that uh, you have heard today, I think in some ways is just the beginning of a remarkable story where Mari Lou uh, has taken principles uh, of uh, basic cognitive science so, so beautifully uh, uh, done by uh, Eve and Justine Sargent, and applied them to human diseases, uh, frontotemporal dementias and Alzheimer's disease. And I think there's no, no person in the world uh, who has been more responsible for allowing us to recognize down to the specific molecule, the cause for uh, progressive language uh, disorders and progressive disorders of visual perception. This is the core of Marilou's work and it's simply brilliant. Uh, I should also add that uh, Mari Lou is uh, moving into a new phase of, of her career where she's not only studying elders with degenerative diseases, but she is also now the leader of our Charles Schwab Dyslexia Center. So Dean Cassette, I hope we contribute to a more understanding of the genetics of uh, dyslexia with the center and hopefully we could uh, collaborate with you in this space. Um, this is a massive effort that Marilou has undertaken. She is not only thinking about uh, the children, uh, the cognitive uh, disorders or, or differences in learning that they may have, um, working with the poorest schools uh, uh, in, in San Francisco Bay Area, even working in prisons, thinking about how these learning differences uh, uh, change the trajectory of people, people with enormous talent. Um, Finally, I want to say a word or two about the spirit of Mari Lou. Uh, uh, she is the finest mentor I have ever met. Um, she brings a spirit of joy uh, for the science, but she realizes that the scientific people that she is mentoring are, are more than just scientists. They're people uh, and uh, they have lives. And 
the way that Mari Lu mentors uh, uh, people, uh, I would say extraordinary for men, but even more extraordinary in the way that she has worked with women. Um, uh, it has just been a joy to watch. Uh, and uh, uh, there are so many uh, children of Mari Lu, like Simona, uh, Valentina, who are on their way to make uh, you know, a big splash in the world. I'm very finally very moved by the story of Justine and Eve uh, Sargent. And, and I wonder if in this new world that Mari Lu is creating, if there had been that kind of network that Mari Lu uh, brings to touching people around her, that the outcome might have been different. So uh, also a toast to Mari Lu's spirit, which uh, uh, brings joy to all of us. And nothing gives me more joy in the history of Mari Lu's uh, career with us than this prize, uh, so deserved. And uh, I am so moved. Thank you so much, uh, uh, both uh, uh, Audoyen Patrick Cossette and uh, uh, to you, Professor Miller. So um, I'm sure that uh, both of you and all of us, uh, we would like uh, to uh, really uh, make tangible uh, this uh, award. So I will ask Mary Lou to pick the box that was delivered by FedEx, UPS, or whatever, <laughs> and to open the box um, and to show us, uh, it's not really, um, um, it's what we could do <laughs> given the condition, <laughs> but the advantage is that we're all here. Uh, it was uh, more than 125 people uh, who uh, attended in direct, and here's the parchment. Uh, so bravo to you. Uh, Mary Lou, well deserved, well deserved. And and so this is officially signed by the dean uh, and 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 myself, uh, recognizing the uh, uh, the award. You also have um, an envelope somewhere in that box. Don't uh, lose the envelope because there's a, a price uh, in there which accompanies the uh, the. Uh, award. It's not a lot in US dollars, but it's uh, still 10,000 Canadian dollars. So, <laughs> so I, again, I so maybe you, <laughs> so um, thanks to everyone. Mary Lou, you want to take one minute uh, or it's, it's okay for you? Thank you so much. I, it, it's so meaningful to me. Thank you all for being here. It's as, as Eve said, you know, I wish we could be in person and I could give you a hug and a few tears, uh, but the silver lining is having people from all over the world. And uh, it was really fun while preparing this talk to rethink of all the times together and um, so grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou. And I would like to thank Catherine Dubé, uh, who uh, really coordinated uh, the, all, all that we live together, including the package with your staff and trying to track where you would be for that Zoom today, because one possibility would, that, would have been that you would have been closer to uh, Professor Miller, but still uh, thanks to Professor Miller for having participated and to everybody. So thank you so much again. and. Uh, Enjoy the award because it's really well deserved. Thank you so much. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Eve. Beautiful ceremony. Congratulations again. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.